Let's take our Bibles in turn, please, to uh, Colossians chapter uh, chapter number two as we come to God's Word this morning. And and I trust that uh, this these uh, sir, these messages from this book have been of utmost help. They have helped me, and I trust that they've helped you, been a blessing to you. Uh, we live in some some very interesting times, aren't we? And of course. The Bible says that uh, this know also in the last days perilous times shall come. And uh, certainly I believe we're living in some perilous times. And there's an assault having been made and being made currently on truth. As I was talking to our men this morning, I, I'm burdened today. I, I'm burdened for, for us as a church. I'm burdened for us individually. And my prayer is that God would help us choose truth over the world. You see, the things of the world pass away. In, in, in 1 John chapter 2, the Bible says to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away with the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And I'm thankful that the will of God is, is no secret. Aren't you thankful that God's will is perfectly stated for us in His Word? You know, how can I abide forever? How can I live? How can I have eternal life by doing the will of God? What is the will of God? Well, the Bible says in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, who God will have all men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Him. And Jesus said, if you, uh, the, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if the Son has therefore set you free, you shall be free indeed. And I'm thankful for the freedom that we have. And you know, the Bible talks of, refers to this freedom as liberty. We're not to use our liberty... Uh, make, uh, causing us to be entangled in bondage, right? Now we, we think of what is this bondage? Bondage to the law. Bondage to the, to the world's systems. Bondage to sin. And I'm thankful for what Paul has outlined for us here in the book of Colossians. Under the inspiration of God, he's given us the way to live victoriously. What is the answer? You know, there's a lot of people who say they have the answers, but they don't have the answer. We have the answer today. We hold it in our hands. The Bible is more, does more than contain the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. And I'm thankful that you and I have the truth. And as Paul, as Paul writes, God is teaching us some valuable things. You see... The, the church in Colossae, Paul had, though he, Paul had never been there, though he had never seen these people face to face, he was deeply burdened for them because they were living in a very worldly place, a uh, very secular, very humanistic, much like the world is here today. And you know, there's many philosophies, many ideas that uh, that people say that they're enlightened and that they have, and and if you follow these simple steps, you're going to have your best life now. What a bunch of baloney, you know? But what is the answer? Friends, Jesus is the answer. John, or Paul writes, and he's, he's conveying uh, this truth that Jesus is all in all. He's all you need. And, and interestingly enough, I, I, I hope that you've read through the book of Colossians. It's only four short chapters. You probably read it in five, maybe ten minutes if you're a slow reader like I am. But Paul covers a wide variety of subjects. He covers life. He covers home. He covers church. He covers every facet of life. And the, and the answer is always the same. It's Jesus. Jesus is the solution. He's the answer. And if you're able this morning, I invite you to stand with me as we read together here in God's Word. We're going to begin reading in, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 6. We're going to continue a message we began last Sunday night. And uh, notice what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, and beginning in verse number 6. 
As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the old body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, uh, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him up from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Just think of that. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary uh, to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. And God, our prayer is that we would hear from You today. Father, the last thing these people need to hear are My words. Lord, no one needs to hear what I have to say this morning. We just need to hear from You. And so, Father, our prayer right in this moment is a prayer of absolute surrender. Lord, we yield ourselves to You fully and completely. Not in some mystical, crazy sense, God. Lord, we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit who lives within us. And Father, we pray that Your Word would make the difference in our lives here today. That You would help us know what it means to live the Christian life. God, without You, we can do nothing. We recognize our complete and utter insufficiency and ability and capabilities, Lord. We just need You today. Lord, I pray that You'd rescue us from the world's way of thinking and that You'd lead us to victory. Lord, that You'd help us Lord, may Your will be done in every heart and every life. Lord, again, our prayer is that if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. Father, we pray this for Your glory, not ours. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bibles, I'd like to draw your attention to what the Word of God says back in Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 6. It's a statement I encouraged you to mark last Sunday night, and and I want to encourage you, don't miss a service. Uh, You miss a service, you miss what God has for you in His Word. We're, we're, We're moving through the Word of God, not hopping around, but Sunday morning, Sunday night, we're working through the same book, and I'm fearful that we're going to miss what God has for us. But in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, there's a statement here that, uh, that really strikes a chord. It hits home for all of us. The Bible says, so walk ye in Him. So walk ye in Him. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. What is this talking about? It's talking about living the Christian life. How can I live for the Lord? Do you realize that's why you and I are here today? To live for the Lord? You know, at the moment of salvation, the Lord, it's it's not out of His power. He could have designed the Christian life so that at the moment of salvation, we were taken up, you know, out of of this place into heaven right away. As a matter of fact, that was one of the obstacles we had with one of our children. Uh, Maybe you've, you know, one of our, our youngest boy, Gideon, we kept talking. He knew that he was a sinner. You know, he knew he needed to accept Jesus as his Savior, but he was fearful to do it. You know why? He didn't want to go to heaven right away. You know? You know, I want to stay here, right? It's kind of cute. It's kind of funny. 
God could do it, but he chose not to. He's left us here. Why? To live our lives for him. To bring him glory. For his pleasure we are and we're created. Friends, it is, it is our job as Christian people to live for Jesus Christ. Turn with me in your Bibles back to the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter number 5, I want you to notice here in our Lord's great sermon on the mount, in some very familiar passages of Scripture here, we find our, uh, an instruction uh, given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ concerning how we live. You see, it matters how we live our lives, doesn't it? You know, I'm not, I am not my own. You know, sometimes we have the thinking, well, I'm my own person. I can live how I want. I can do what I want. That's not it at all. You no longer belong to you. At the moment of salvation, uh, you become the Lord's. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, you are responsible not for you, but to live a life of obedience to the things of God's Word. And in Matthew chapter 5, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse number 13. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, and to be trodden underfoot of men. Notice, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither uh, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Notice verse number 16, where the rubber meets the road. Christians, you and I, were the salt of the earth, we're the light of the world. The Bible says in verse number 15, I'm sorry, verse 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and he makes a statement, he says, Whether ye eat therefore or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Christians, you and I are to live our lives for Jesus Christ. And as we look back in Colossians chapter number 2, we find the command, so walk ye in Him. Live live your life for the Lord. How did you, do you remember the, the day that you accepted Christ as your Savior? I can take you back. The address was 424 East William Street, Hastings, Michigan, 49058. It was a little tan house at, at, a, at the end of this cul-de-sac. And uh, you drive in, you go through the front door, uh, and immediately there's a land, there's the, the staircase is on the left. You go up the flight, there's a little landing. I think there's two more steps. It takes you up to the upstairs. You go down the hallway. My room was the second door on the left. Right there in that bedroom, January 7th, 1989, I bowed my head and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And you know how I did it? I did it by faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus, listen, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Christians, as ye have therefore received Christ, so walk ye in Him. Friends, we are to live our lives for Jesus Christ. It's talking about, and this walk, this life that we live, it's all encompassing. Do you ever segregate your life? Do you ever disconnect things from your life? Well, this is my my work life. This is my home life. And this is my church life. Right? Right? Does, does life work that way? We sometimes, you know, you ever heard of people living a double life? Anybody ever, people living a double life, you know? Uh, all kinds of craziness goes on in the world today. But the Lord doesn't want us to live a double life. He doesn't want our life to be in conflict with itself. More importantly, He does not want our lives to be in conflict with our relationship with Jesus Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Live your life in a manner that brings glory and honor to Jesus Christ. As the Word of God describes our life, the Word of God uses an interesting word. And we talked a little bit about it last Sunday night, the word conversation. And in our modern speech, we would think of a conversation as being 
a dialogue between two people. We're having a conversation. You know, it's what my wife and I do in the evenings. We sit down and we try to have a, a conversation, an adult conversation, without any interruption from children, you know? We try to have a conversation, a, a dialogue, talk about our day. That's not the conversation of the Bible. The word conversation in Scripture refers to every facet of your life. I want you to turn with me this morning to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, uh, chapter number 1. Uh, 1 Peter, chapter number 1. We, we find an interesting statement here concerning the manner by, uh, by which we live our lives. In 1 Peter, chapter 1, in verse number 15, the Bible says, But as, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Not just your speech, uh, not just what you say, but what, everything you do, everywhere you go, every bit of entertainment that you allow in your, in your mind, in through your eyes and in your ears, everything that comes out of your mouth, everything in your life, your conversation. Look again. But as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Why? Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Why do we try to live? None of us in here are perfect. We recognize that. You know, we're not, I'm not speaking to you this morning as a person holier than thou. Oh no, not at all. But my heart's desire today is to live a life that, that glorifies and honors Jesus Christ. Why? Because He's worthy, isn't He? He alone is worthy to live for. He, is the, he alone is worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. He is holy. That is His defining attribute, is God's holiness. Yes, we know He's all-powerful and all-present, all-knowing. We know that He's immutable, that He doesn't change. We know He's almighty. We know all of these things. But He's holy. And He asks us, He commands us, saying, Be ye holy, for I am holy. As we turn back to Colossians chapter number 2, again we read the command, So walk ye in Him, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Last Sunday night we began outlining several things. We only got through the first thing. The first way that we can live our lives for Jesus Christ. Don't you want to bring glory and honor to your Savior? Man, how do we do it? Well, number one, we do it by faith. Look there in verse number six. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. How did you receive Him? Received Him by faith. The Christian life is the faith life. The just shall live by faith. We live by faith in Christ. We live by faith in His Word. And we made the statement last Sunday night, if God's Word uh, tells us not to do it, we ought not do it. Right? If, if I don't have peace in my heart, if I can't do it, if I can't make a decision and trust that I'm doing it by faith and that it's right and what's what God has for me to do, I don't do it. I've done it in the past and live to regret it. But the just shall live by his faith. Notice the second lesson that we learned this morning. Look, look what the Bible says in verse number seven. I want you to write these things down. The first way we live the Christian life is by faith. The second way, notice, is that we must make God's Word, our life's authority. What is your authority today? Look what the Bible says in verse number 7 of Colossians chapter number 2. It says, Rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. As ye have been taught. Where had they, how had they been taught? From whence had they been taught? This word, it was the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You know, Epaphras went, Epaphras was saved, I believe, under Paul's ministry. And Epaphras was burdened for this place. And Epaphras, he learned from the Apostle Paul the Apostle's doctrine. 
And he went to Colossae. He taught them the things that he had been taught. Interestingly enough, reminded of what the Bible says in, in 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse 2, and the things that thou hast heard among, uh, of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Right? You take the Word of God and we invest it in the lives of other people. But Christians, we must be settled with this authority. Who is your authority? Turn back in your Bibles to the book of Judges, if you would please. The book of Judges. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. There's a key verse in the book of Judges, and it's quite telling. In Judges, chapter 21, notice what the Word of God says, the final verse of this book. The Bible says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. What is your authority? How do you live your life? What is the deciding factor of your life? Do you do, you do the things that you deem to be acceptable and right? Or is God's Word your authority? We must come to the decision this morning that we make God's Word our authority because there are times in life when your life will be in conflict with God's Word. In which way will you go? Will you choose truth? Or will you choose the world? You know, and I'm reminded of, the, of a story here. It's really on the next page. It's the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth was recorded for us during the time of the judges. Remember, a time during which every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was no authority. There was no king in Israel. But there was a king in Israel. You know who the king in Israel was? It was God. Israel was not designed to be a monarchy. God was to be their king. and It was to be a theocracy. There was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We find the story here of, of, of Ruth, this Moabitess woman. But look back in verse number 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, in the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and, the, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Well, it just seemed what the right thing to do. They lived to regret it. They left the place that God had given them to dwell, and they suffered great loss. You know what happened to Elimelech? Many of you know the story. Elimelech died there in the land of Moab. And you know who else died in the land of Moab? His children. Malon and Chilion. That's what's going to happen if we choose to live in the world. If we choose to, to take the world and, and uh, live according to what we want, it is detrimental to our lives, the lives of those we love. You know, we know the story. God made things special. Ruth, of course, returned with Naomi. She got married to Boaz. And, and through Boaz, you know, they had a little boy and, uh, named Obed. And Obed had a son named Jesse. And Jesse had a son named David. Right? And on down the line, David had a son through lineage named Jesus, the Son of God. We consider our lives, however. What will we choose? What will your authority in life be? We, you, there are, we have been indoctrinated and taught to not think for ourselves. God has been taken out of every important institution in our land. And he's been replaced. 
by humanism, atheism, things that, that are in, in complete conflict with the Word of God. You know what humanism teaches you and me? It teaches us that there is no God, that we're here by mistake, that you're just an animal. And then the world gets frustrated when we act like animals. Right? They devalue human life. And there's to live and let live mentality. There's no authority. As it, well, you are your authority. But Christian, in our lives, that ought not be the case. As we look here in the book of Colossians, look back in Colossians chapter 2 and recognize today that if we're going to live the Christian life and have victory and enjoy the life that God has given us to live, remember in John chapter 10 and verse 10 that the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus says, I am come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. But if we're going to have that abundant life, well, there has to be an authority. Have you ever noticed in your home that uh, your children are miserable when there's no authority? Everybody needs authority. You realize that? Uh, that my wife and I, we've had observations when our children were younger, and uh, you know, we had to do like Barney and nip it in the bud uh, a couple times, you know, and uh, get some things taken care of and let some people know in our house that what dad and mom says, that is the law, you know? You ever see, you ever, you ever watch a disobedient child? Awful, isn't it? There's no authority. You know what? They're miserable. And it isn't just small children. We became familiar with a, with a set of circumstances earlier this week. There was no authority in this person's home. Child is, the teenage child is miserable. There's no authority. Christian, your life will be miserable. Your Christian life will be a failure if the Word of God is not your authority. Look what the Bible says back in verse 7. It says, rooted and built up and established in the faith. What is the faith? Turn in your Bibles, if you would, please. Back to the book of Jude. We were here Thursday night ever so briefly. But in Jude, verse number 3, Notice what the Bible says as Jude speaks to the early church. He says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. What is the faith? The faith is the Word of God. It was once inspired uh, and forever preserved. The Bible says in First, Pe I'm sorry, Second Peter, chapter number, uh, chapter number one. Turn there with me, if you would, please. Second Peter, uh, chapter number one, and consider the authority of God's word here today, friends. What we what we talk of here, this is not man's opinion. This isn't what we think about something. It's not some cunningly devised fable that God warns us of. In fact, it's the truth. It's the Word of God. And the Bible says, knowing this first in verse 20 of, of 2, John, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they uh, were moved by the Holy Ghost. Friends, the Word of God must be our authority. Because it's not man's Word. It's God's Word. All Scripture it's given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Christians, we've got to establish the fact that God's Word is our authority. If it's not, it ought to be. If it's not, you can correct that today. If it's not, you can make it right this morning. If it's not, you can certainly... Do what God would have you do today. 
Why is God's Word authoritative? Well, it's an errant. <laughs> you realize that in this book, this King James Version of the Bible, we hold this morning in our hands, there's no errors in this book. Aren't you thankful that the Word of God is an errant? It means there's nothing wrong with this book. It doesn't omit anything. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't call anything into question. It just plainly states, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Turn not from the right hand or to the left. Friends, we must come to realize today that we don't have an authority that is corrupt. We have an inerrant authority the Bible says again in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, not just some of it, all of it is given by inspiration of God. And the Bible says in Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, Making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure. Enlightening the eyes. Friends, not only is the Word of God inspired, but is, it is verbally and, and plenarily inspired. What does that mean? How many of you have ever heard the words verbal or plenary when it speaks of the Scripture and the inspiration of God's Word? What does that mean? It means all of God's Word is inspired. Every word. Not just the thoughts, but every single word. Down to the most insignificant, minuscule punctuation. All of it is given by inspiration of God. As a matter of fact, listen to what the Word of God says. Uh, and again, back in 2 Peter chapter number 1. Turn there with me if you would please. 2 Peter chapter number 1. I want you to notice here what the Word of God says. 2 Peter chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 16, it says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He, Christ, received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom... I am well pleased. This is speaking of the Mount of Transfiguration when, when the deity of Christ uh, shined through His humanity and they saw Christ. Peter, James, and John saw Christ for who He is. The one true and living God. The Bible says, In this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with Him in the Holy Mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. It's more sure, it's more reliable, more dependable than anything your eyes could ever see, than anything your ears could ever hear, than anything your life could ever experience. We have the Word of God. It's a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, the day star arise in your heart. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Every little, a jot and a tittle, they were the smallest abbreviations or punctuation marks in the Hebrew alphabet. But friends, the Word of God is verbally and plenarily inspired. It's authoritative in our lives. We can trust it. We can depend upon the Lord. You know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful that it's also preserved. Why don't you turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Psalm 12. Psalm number 12. There are some people that say, well, we had the Word of God. But we no longer have it. That would be a, an erroneous statement to make. There are some people that believe that, uh, that this book contains God's Word, but you know, down through the ages it's been corrupted and polluted by man. What kind of God do you serve? 
My God is Almighty God. My God is, is the God who speaks and the world is created. Right? My God is the God who saves me by, by grace through faith. And that there's nothing too hard for my God. Can you imagine, just imagine for a moment, the amount of power it took for God to get His Word to us. And we have the audacity to step back and think, well, He gave it to us, but there's no way He can make sure that it's kept for us. Right? Silliness, isn't it? It's it's illogical. Either you can trust God's Word or you can't. Either, Either God's Word is true or all of us here today are lost. Because if God's Word has errors, where, where do you stop? What, what part has errors? What, what part can we not trust? It's all or nothing, friends. All or nothing. The Bible says in Psalm 12, verse 6, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Christians, the Word of God is preserved Forever, forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. The Word of God is eternal. And I'm thankful that we have it in our own heart language today and that it's dependable and reliable, that it's that, so, it's that hammer that breaks the rock to pieces. It's that sword that's sharp, uh, that's sharp, that's sharper than two-edged sword, right? You know what I'm talking about. That was my Joe Biden impression, you know. <laughs> you know, the, that thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, that thing. (laughs) A more sure word, friends. It's quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Authoritative. Friends, the Word of God is the only foundation upon which we can build our lives our homes, this church. Turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter number 6 today. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. And note what the Word of God says beginning in verse number 6. All of us here want a good home, don't we? And I want my home to be great. I want my home to be what God designed my home to be. I want my marriage to be what God designed my marriage to be. And the only way that will happen is if God's Word is my authority. Look what the Bible says in verse number 6. He says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Friends, there's no problem in your home that the Word of God cannot fix. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and house is full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, and vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware. Friends, look in verse 12. We've got the caution here. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve Him and shalt swear by His name. Christians, we've got to make the Word of God the authority. This must be the foundation. This must be the authority. We've made the statements before in church that the Word of God is the sole authority of our faith and practice And rightly so, it ought to be. The Bible says, And wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, but by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Do you want the word? You want, what kind of life do you want? That's that's what you've got to decide today. The world is full of of the glitz and glamour. Uh, There there are churches more interested with entertaining people 
than teaching them what teaching thus saith the Lord. What do you want? You can't have it both ways. You might say, well, Pastor, that's awful black and white. Well, my, my Bible is black and white. You know? There's, there's no middle ground. There's no ground to give up. Christians, is the Word of God your authority? I pray so. If it's not, there's no way you can live a life that pleases the Lord. The Word of God is it. Friends, you've heard the statement, the buck stops here. This is where it's at. So walk ye in Him. If we're going to walk with the Lord, if we're going to live the Christian life, we've got to do it by faith. We've got to do it in accordance with this book. This is our, this is our, this is the Christian life owner's manual, right? The operation manual. This is how we make sure everything works properly. Rooted and built up and established in the faith. As you have been taught, bounding therein with thanksgiving. Authority. What's your authority today? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's all stand to our feet this morning.